Okay, Alex, we're live. Take it away. Welcome, everyone. I'm Alejandra Ceja, Vice President of the Office of Social Impact and Inclusion. On behalf of our office and Level Up, our millennial and millennial-minded business impact group, I want to thank you all for joining today's Leadership and Equity series. The goal of the series is to create meaningful dialogue on issues of race, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and to address topics of importance that are tied to our mission, our philanthropy, and our community engagement. There will be a Q&A box available so that you can ask our guest speaker questions. And I'm really excited to introduce you to a phenomenal leader uh, in Newark, in the community that is doing amazing things. Our guest speaker today is Natasha Rogers. She is the first Chief Operating Officer for the City of Newark. In this role, Natasha developed strategic policy focused on urban innovation, operational efficiency, and public-private partnerships. Equipped with degrees in law, engineering, and finance, Natasha leverages her extensive interdisciplinary background to enact triple bottom line impact within New Jersey's largest city. Natasha will be returning to the private sector to continue solving complex issues from a corporate perspective and as always from a lens of equity. Moderating today's live discussion is our colleague Mateus Baptista, Deputy Director for Strategy and External Affairs in the Office of Social Impact and Inclusion. We're excited to get our conversation underway. Mateus, turning it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. I am so excited that we are having this conversation today with my friend Natasha Rogers. There's a lot we're going to learn, a lot of ground we're going to cover. As you heard from Alex's intro, Natasha has done lots of very interesting work in her career and we'll share some of those insights. We'll talk about a career journey, career planning. We'll talk about mentorship versus sponsorship and the role of mentorship in career growth. And we'll cover all of these topics in the next hour. As Alex also mentioned, we're excited for this to be interactive. So as you're hearing, as you're learning things, make sure to put some questions in the Q&A comment box and we'll be sure to get to those towards the end of our time together. So let's get started. Natasha, thank you for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing well. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Of course, we are, we're really excited and we wanna to get to your career. So we want to talk <laughs> lots about your career growth and career trajectory, but before doing so, before getting there, we want the viewers to get to know you a little bit better. So what are three adjectives that best describe you? Um, I would have to say these are the uh, adjectives that I focus on trying to be. What's interesting is I had to ask others, oh, what do you, what, how would you describe me? And I mm. like did a comparison, but the adjectives that I would use to describe myself are authentic, courageous, and innovative. Mm. Um, good for me that a lot of those same adjectives came back when I asked others. Um, so that was good. But yeah, so those are, I think those are the three that I would use to describe me. And mm. some are stronger. They all work in combo with one another, but some get stronger based upon the situation. <laughs> right. Well, I love the courageous because I think we're going to have some courageous conversations today. So we'll put that to use. Um, but you're a Newarker. You were raised in the city of Newark and um, you came back to Newark. So tell us how your upbringing in this city helped shape you, helped inform your trajectory uh, that ultimately landed you back working for the current mayor. Yes, yeah, so I, I think my, I would say my upbringing is pretty complex um, and I don't often talk about it. <laughs> Um, so I'm born and raised in Newark. Um, I'm adopted. Um, I was uh, placed in foster care literally as a newborn. Um, my birth mother gave birth and, you know, decided in the hospital that, you know, her being a mom wasn't necessarily her destiny. And I spent, you know, um, you know, probably six months in the hospital while people were trying to figure things out. And I was placed into state, you know, um, control, I guess one could say, and placed into the foster care system and ultimately adopted um, by a single mom. And that was a unique situation because my mom that raised me was 50 years old. So a 50 year old raising a um, newborn. 
And my mom was a first generation Newarker. Um, she was born in North Carolina. She came here in the Great Migration, like so many other Newarkers. Um, and she was doing the best that she could and wanted to, you know, at least what the means that she had extend the extend that to, um, you know, basically myself. And I also have a younger sister who was also adopted. Um, and I, I, I give that context because it's important um, because my mom let me know like in second grade, I was about eight, nine, that she only had an eighth grade education. And at that point in time, she could not assist me with my homework anymore. And her direct advice was, you know, I'm sending you to school. There are teachers there to help you. You have to open your mouth and ask for help because I'm letting you know that I'm not going to be able to assist you. Mm. And those words have guided me throughout my whole life. The reality of it is, is that if you want assistance, you have to ask for it. As a result, I'm a very vocal individual. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, most of the time I tend to, um, you know, advocate not only for myself, but for others, um, because I understand that some, while we all have a voice, everyone doesn't know how to use that. Um, so really my upbringing was really about grit and grace. Um, I had the privilege of growing up in New Community Corporation. And for those that don't know, New Community Corporation was the first large development to come into the city after the rebellion in 68. Um, and it was the largest housing project for the longest of times in, in the city of Newark. So I grew up in a townhouse, not the projects. I had a, you know, a backyard and green grass. And so when you juxtapose that against this idea of like the urban jungle or poverty in Newark, I didn't really have optically that experience. Um, but there were lots of days, and I think that lots of my childhood, I will say, I, if I had to title it, it was just, you know, really um, surrounded by hunger. I was hungry for like lots of days, and that drove me to do a lot of things because of my, you know, lack of us having lack of food. I was always working, always doing things, so I always learned to maximize my opportunities. Um, one could say I'm a child prodigy. I taught myself to code in elementary school. This is as a result of corporations donating technology to my elementary school. And also because I was getting kicked out of class. Um, what people didn't realize was that I was advancing at a very accelerated rate versus the lesson plan. And therefore that was causing disruption because I'm one of 30 children in a classroom and the professor teacher you know, just has to focus on everything else. Luckily for me, my elementary school had a, 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 a computer lab and therefore you know, I jumped into that and, and did that work. Um, Interestingly enough, I did a lot of things very, very early on. Um, I managed, I worked two jobs as a high school student. I went to Science High, which was then and still now the top ranked high school in the city of New York, uh, city of Newark. Um, I was working two jobs there. My first job ever was at Newark Public Schools. I worked in their architectural department, mm. um, designing, helping their architects design schools. Didn't know what I was doing. Of course, <laughs> I'm only 14. Um, and that was a result of just a program that wanted to place students in summer summer um, jobs distributed through the city of Newark. And because I needed the money when the summer was over, I negotiated for me to stay home for the school year. And the reason I, uh, the rationale I gave everyone was that, um, you know, you want to continue on with this experience. So not only did I stay on with the school year, but I brought four of my friends that were, I made during that summer. And we basically had a team, <laughs> a student team, and I managed for other of Newark students, and that was my first management position. Um, so I'm like a junior in high school doing that work. And at the same time, I negotiated a job at Burger King, created a title for myself, customer service professional. <laughs> I hired eight students from across the city, and we had our own like uh, team and ships. So I had two management jobs at a high school student, and I'm taking cl college classes at NJIT and doing all this work. And it was really about I didn't want to be hungry. <laughs> I really didn't. Um, and I wanted to really be able to maximize what was going around on around me. At mm -hmm. home, it was just really, really lonely. Um, and you know, I just wanted activity. I wanted to stay busy. Mm -hmm. And from there, everything just kind of uh, transformed from there. I got more opportunities to be part of more programs. My first corporate position actually was at PSCNG. Al Copy gave me an opportunity to be an admin. Interestingly enough, my my mother's career ambition for me, my entire career was to be a secretary. And I did that at 17. Um, once I left PSCNG, 
I joined a program called En-ROADS, and En-ROADS is, you know, a great organization that's across the nation, and their goal is to create a diverse pipeline of um, corporate citizens. And um, through there, I was able to, you know, work with three, four other corporations, and that just launched me um, for the rest of my career. So it's been a, um, one could say, a great journey because everyone looks at everything post college, but even pre-college, I had a diverse experience. And right. that was as a result of really leveraging programs that the city of Newark offered, um, mostly out of need though, not because of a desire or ambition, mm -hmm. um, really because we were working poor and I needed money. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I, I think your negotiating skills in high school, there's a lot folks could learn on the call <laughs> as they're thinking about their uh, end of fiscal year conversations yes. with their managers. Uh, you know, the, the, those negotiating skills and the self-advocacy are very hard to learn, right? Um, so we'll definitely get there. And I, and I love your point about grit and grace, right? And um, how do you navigate both of those um, and use both of those skills as you're navigating your life and your career, knowing you need to pull one and the other, right? Um, I want to turn a little bit more to your career and you, you laid out some of the early steps that were already sort of fundamental to your career growth and you left most recently you left private equity and you came to work at city hall in public service it's not a choice many people would make leaving private equity for public service but you did that walk us through the calculus and what you learned from that private sector to public sector transition well, it definitely wasn't planned. I think most of it was serendipity. Um, when I was in high, when I was in uh, law school, um, my focus in law school was that I made a transition from one profession to another, and that was the only transition I ever envisioned making. I worked at a consumer products company, Anheuser Busch InBev, got my start here in the city of Newark, working at their brewery, and then went to be like third highest ranking person in the supply chain division in North America in St. Louis, and made a sudden one could say a certain transition because my career was off to a very great start and it seemed like I was going to you know, accelerate within the company even without after the merger. But Hurricane Katrina hit and it really impacted me personally because I wanted to really find out how does a city survive such a devastating um, circumstance. And then how do cities like New Orleans in general, specifically urban black cities, um, regain and remain resilient. So I went to law school focused on tax policy. Um, and in law school, interestingly enough, um, a speaker series came and someone from the White House came and they talked about White House fellows and how it was a distinguished group of people that come from the corporate sector and they go into the White House and they do operational effectiveness and efficiency. Um, and they do like a one to two year rotation and then they go back into the corporate sector and you know they've done their public service duty. And I said, oh, this is amazing. I have this, I will have this opportunity later on in life. So my plan was at the end of the uh, Obama administration that I was going to prepare my application and submit and your employers have to recommend you. Um, Despite uh, you know um, the uh, Democrat candidate um, losing, I was still going to apply anyway. Um, my employers refused to write the recommendation. That's just how it happened. They said like absolutely not, mm. um, and they just said it just it just won't be. You're not thinking about it you know correctly. You're not going to be as effective as you think that you're going to be. And you know sometimes you just got to take advice. So I'm in private equity. I'm doing great work. Um, I was pegged to be there. Um, basically, I was recruited to go there because they wanted a turnaround situation. I was known in the Wall Street community as a person that like can roll up their sleeves and get things done and work deeply with people. Um, they were going through a regulatory crisis and I, along with six other bankers from across New York City, were asked to come and I was doing great work. And then I got a random call from the mayor. Don't know the pay didn't know the mayor personally at the time. Um, didn't participate in campaigns in Newark. I had just came back to the city maybe three or four years prior. Um, after being away for eight years across, you know, living across, you know, the state, across the nation in various cities. And he asked me to join his team. 
And I was just like, one, it was so interesting because I was like, one, who are you? Because he didn't really introduce himself. <laughs> I guess he just has a presence and he assumes that everyone knows. And then I had to ask him, I was like, what is it that you exactly want me to do? And we both didn't know. He just said, I know that I, you know, I want you to be a part of this, my second term. And I basically created my own job description, but also my interview process. I took it upon myself to interview or be interviewed by other mayors in the northern region to say, this is my skill set. You're running a city. How would that marry? And through that conversation, I said, OK, Mayor, I'm, I'm coming back to you. I would like to join you, but I have to join in this um, uh, position. Mm -hmm. And we created the first chief operating officer. And it was specifically for two reasons. I didn't want to be the mayor's uh, strategic advisor um, because that would mean that the time would be that I am advising him. And the reality of it is, is I wanted to advise the city. I wanted to maximize opportunities for the city. And then secondly, it was situational. It was about leadership because a COO, no matter what the industry is, is always going to ask probing questions. Given the package, um, you know, African-American woman and a young woman at that, asking people questions that have been in institutions for a long people of time can be seen as um, abrasive or aggressive. Mm -hmm. And me living through microaggressions already in my time, I said I have to you know, frame this in a way that creates the best defense for me. Um, so as a result, we came up with Chief Operating Officer and I've been doing that work since. Mm. That's great. And and you've had, you know, so you mentioned this, uh, lots of growth and transitions you've had in your in your career so far. And we are partnering with Level Up, which is the millennial and yeah. the millennial minded impact group. And one of the um, bad sort of reputations that millennials get is for career hopping and career switching. I love your, to hear your thoughts on what, what is that about? Why is that happening? And, and what do companies need to be thinking about when thinking when when with a goal to retain that kind of talent? Yeah, I think language is important um, and how we frame things really sets the tone for how conversations are you know, enacted. And for me, career changing and association, associating that with millennials is really a trope. Um, and I don't think that we should get caught up in it. Um, I think we should understand the context. So millennials are from the age or born in the range of 1980 to 1996. And we think about the history of what has happened from 1980 to 1996 will really showcase how we have been entrepreneurialism in that response and learn how to pivot. So in my perspective, you know, I was born in 1980. I'm 40 years old. I've celebrated my 40th birthday this year. Um, I have experienced, you know, uh, three financial downturns, um, you know, the Great Recession, uh, you know, the SAP fallout. I think that was in 2003 or 2005. 2003, I believe, because I remember so many of my peers in engineering school had their job offers rescinded. We've experienced 9-11 um, and, you know, the Great Recession recently and now COVID-19. So, you know, I don't think any generation other than those that have been in a war generation have been affected so adversely when it comes to their ability to grow within companies and also the ability to maximize their revenue, right? So many people have started over not once, not twice, but three or four times. With that said, we have to be um, nimble in that. And as re and with being nimble, you respond in what I would say a positive way. So when we say career switchers, it doesn't necessarily read as positive. At the same time, the world is more global and your ability to move is easier than it was than compared to your parents. Right. So, you know, I've moved and lived in six different cities um, just because, you know, I've had the opportunity to, right? Um, and then lastly, with the nimbleness and the growth of markets, we see that there's a lot more opportunities for us to have our own or you know just in general the everyday human to own their own, own company do a startup even ipo right right now we're going through a spac spac um you know boom and as you can see as we see the opportunity to be a successful entrepreneur exists so the reality of it is is that millennials seize the moment and what companies need to understand is that we're always going to be curious. Um, we're always going to be innovative. And the next question is, is the work that we're doing satiating the appetite? So just because you're moving in positions and gaining new skills doesn't necessarily mean you're switching a career. You're actually growing a career. So I don't think that people switch careers that often they may be switching companies. But the, the question is, are you gaining new skills in each point in time? 
Um, you know, just to wind it down, I remember someone writing an article about me recently, maybe the last two years, and I didn't find it too fondly. Um, it was kind of like, oh, she's done stints in these places. And I was like, but each stint, I've had like a billion dollar impact in that industry, in that company. I left that company better than I found it, right? So it goes again about the importance of language. You know, if you're leaving a company better, a division more you know, um, efficient, you're cultivating talent each every time you go somewhere, then that's not a career changer, that's a career leader. Mm -hmm. That's my answer to that. Mm. I love that. Career leaders, not career changers, <laughs> who are building the set yes. of skills, uh, building blocks, right? The kind of skills that build a, a, a career. We also know that what is so important for career, particularly for underrepresented groups, women, other minorities, yes. are mentors and sponsors. Mm -hmm. So I really want to dive into the difference. And in your career, have you had sponsors? Who have they been and how have they helped influence your career growth? Yeah, so I've had mentors and I've had sponsors. Um, I've had way more mentors than sponsors, but the sponsors have been you know, um, career shifting in their impact. So to me, I define a mentor as someone that takes, you know, personal investment in your career development or even personal development. And as a result, there is a more frequent um, uh, uh, relationship, a relationship that has more frequencies. We're mm -hmm. talking more through phone or email or things of that sort. And there it's, it's reciprocal. There's a conversation that is happening, right? Um, and there's advice and that can happen at multiple levels. The person doesn't necessarily have to be senior to you. It could be your peer. It could be someone in a totally different industry. Um, and I've had that throughout my career because I've sought it out. Also because inroads kind of lays that foundation. Um, when you start off as an intern, you are assigned a mentor. So that formal language, as far as mentee or mentee, I learned with, through inroads. But as you, you know, grow up in any community, especially the city of Newark, you understand that there's mentors, your neighbor is your mentor. The, the idea that we are a collegial community and we're always looking out for one another just shows that the, we're a fabric of a family. Um, and I think that mentors are an extension of that. Mm. Sponsorship was something that I learned when I um, entered into the corporate world officially as a, a grown up, um, with a, well, I would say a, a college uh, degree. And um, I had a unique experience that I didn't really understand the benefit of until afterwards. So um, I joined Anheuser-Busch in 2003, and it was a, a tough decision. Um, I lost my mom in my junior year of college. Um, so the only parent that I know <laughs> um, has um, passed away um, suddenly and, um, you know, just, tr you know, surviving. And I have a younger sister. She's four years younger than me. And by the time I graduated college, she was graduating high school and I received my offers. And I had an offer to start with Johnson & Johnson in a rotational leadership program. And my first stop was going to be in Japan or I was going to be with Anheuser-Busch. And unfortunately, my sister had a medical condition that, you know, I just had to, I felt better staying stateside to be with her. So I started at Anheuser-Busch and worked there for about a year and a half in a SVP because we're near the airport. His flight got delayed and he wound up sitting in a meeting and observed me with my teammates. Um, and I say teammates because that's how I treated them, but they were, you know, basically they reported to me um, and he liked that exchange. He had never experienced that. And um, literally within two weeks, tapped me to come do special projects for him in St. Louis. And we did went on to do great work. But when I got to St. Louis, um, I didn't know anything about St. Louis. And um, what we know is that um, you know, most organizations and large micro micro um, systems or macro systems are male dominated and white. And what I didn't know was that he had already made advanced steps to make sure that I had a proper onboarding. I did not find this out until I gave my resignation to go to law school. And basically his admin assistant says, I want to let you know what happened when you first transitioned to the company. And what my uh, SVP did for me was that when I got to St. Louis, he arranged for meetings with senior leaders in multiple divisions within the company. And I didn't know that this was abnormal. I'm just thinking like this person's being nice. They're letting me, I'm new to a new city. Um, and you know, his purpose was I need for these senior leaders to know that this is a person that I have tapped to grow within the company. And as a result, you are also going to assist, assist with her growth. 
and you're going to learn about her firsthand before you learn about her through any other circumstance, right? Usually people hear about you through negative feedback first than anything else, because the reality of it is we're in large systems and people don't necessarily, there's less interaction. Secondly, what the you know, ICDP did was that he put me face to face with the highest ranking person of color within the organization. And this person was the CEO of a subsidiary. And I sat down with him and we talked and we had lunch. So what this SVP was doing was that as a sponsor, he was creating mentor relationships for me already. Um, sometimes, most of the time I sought those out beforehand, but he was saying like, I'm specifically like trying to navigate this plan for you. And then lastly, what the admin told me was that he then sat down with his direct reports and said, um, you know, in summation, when we talk about Natasha, we're going to talk about her career development and her work. We're, we're not going to focus on personality. And I was taken aback about that because I'm such a team player and I didn't know what that meant. And the admin, who was also African-American, said, well, because you were younger and probably you didn't have the experience, what he was trying to do was protect you from the idea of we're going to be talking about tone or anything that one could perceive as a microaggression. Because the reality of it is, is that you are the first African-American woman to be leading anything in this organization. And um, we want to make sure that you're successful. And because people you know, don't necessarily have the um, ability or have had the history of dealing with people that are different from them, that fear may resonate into something that's not true. And you know, in hindsight, of all my career experiences those years, five years you know, since I left New Jersey to be with uh, Anderson Bush in St. Louis were the best years ever of my 15 year career. I was able to maneuver through so many circles and do so many innovative projects. I was doing automation of facilities 10 years ago. Right now, that's not a thing, right? Like that's the, what we, we want to happen, but I was be able to lead so many different teams with ease. Um, and knowing that what he did for me was very important. He never mentioned he did those things to me. I did not meet with him frequently. He would come, you know, check in. And, you know, when it was all, not necessarily when it was said and done, but when I, my onboarding process ended with him, and it was probably about two weeks, he made a statement that took me aback, but now I understand everything. He said, I wouldn't know what it felt like to be a white man in an all black organization. Mm. So I'm going to try to do my best. My best may not be good, the best for you at times, but it's the, it's, it's the best as I can do. And no one had ever talked to me about race in the workplace. So I was taken aback about the whole thing, but he, he definitely did his best. And of all the bosses or mentors or sponsors that I've had, um, he has been the extreme example of that. He used deliberate action. He used his social capital. He used his influence and his hierarchy to create a safe space for me. And what um, lastly, what I do know is that he checked in with his colleagues every quarter to see where I was going. So his, I guess, anticipation was that if this was not going the right way, he was going to step back in. But fortunately, everything went well. Right. Yeah. It's someone who, who you're describing a sponsor versus a mentor. Really a sponsor is someone who puts some political chips on the line for you, yeah. right? It's someone who's willing to say, I have some uh, influence and I'm, I'm willing to sort of put some chips down for your behalf, right? Yes. Whereas a mentor is giving you good advice and career growth, meant you know, helping you think through things. Uh, but the sponsor has a sort of a stake. Yes. Right? There's a stake in your yes. invest in your growth. That's a Absolutely. bit different. And that sponsorship has resonated. The effects of that sponsorship has resonated throughout my whole career. Um, when I got to Goldman Sachs, so because I was doing so much great work in Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, that fed back into the community. And then I was asked to be on boards. I was recognized into publications. Because of that recognition, when I got to Goldman Sachs and I worked on certain transactions, if transactions happened in the Midwest, people would call. I remember specifically I worked on the Rams NFL transaction because someone in St. Louis recognized that I remember her from Anheuser-Busch. They were working in the governor's office. Um, and I know she's at Goldman Sachs. I want her on. I want her on this transaction. So that sponsorship, you know, just you know, uh, created such a domino effect. Even now, that sponsorship still resonates. I'm currently negotiating um, a package, and that SVP's name from 15 years ago, his name has come up again, and helping me, you know, just move on um, with my current, you know, project. Right. Right. 
So there's some definitely some leaders listening in today. And as you describe the, the role of this sponsor in your life, there is a leadership responsibility, yes. right? And for those of us who are people managers or senior executives, what is that? What is that role? And particularly as it relates to building that more inclusive decision making table? I think the role has to be one of um, specifically just investment and attachment. Um, as I've gotten older, I do understand that everyone's career is not their all, you know, that it's not their everything. Um, but with that said, leadership has certain responsibilities. So if you as a leader feel as though your goal is to just do specifically your work and it's not to cultivate talent, then I respectfully say that that leader should step aside because we don't have enough space for people to think that it's just the, like cultivating talent is just as important as increasing the bottom line. They go hand in hand. So one, honoring and accepting that. Secondly, also acknowledging the fact that diverse opinions, diverse people um, add value to the company and the bottom line. It's not just about, oh, it makes you know the room feel better or the group picture looks better. It's really about different perspectives add value um, and let you think, look through, um, uh, look behind a clue, I'm sorry, you know, be able to look through blind spots. And what we want to do is that we want to do projects expeditiously and efficiently as possible. And the more voices we have in a room, we're able to think about what the pit stops may be and avoid them. So as a leader, the goal is that, you know, you want to create the best team that you can and to really ask questions about what is inhibiting people from being their best self. And once you find those questions or find those answers, trying to find solutions to those um, creates a better, safer work environment so that people can do their best work possible. Mm. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that advice. And, and I hope that you know, as folks are listening, you're really thinking about what's my role in creating the leadership pipeline, as Natasha is mentioning, what's my role in perhaps acting as a sponsor or a mentor to colleagues and others in, you know, in my group or, or across the company? Um, because as, you, as we've seen, the importance of that in Natasha's in to Natasha's own career growth. So we do want to turn some questions. Um, we have some folks uh, who are sending some questions in. Those of you who are listening, please feel free to submit those through the comment box. But we do have a question from Emily. Emily, are you on and available? Yes. Come on. Great. Awesome. So hi, Natasha. First, I wanted to congratulate uh, you on everything that you've accomplished. I recently just saw um, that project that you worked on in creating the Newark Hope Village. So I was kind of just wondering, like, you know, you've done so much. So what has been one of your favorite projects? <laughs> I think you just uh, you just hit the nail on the head with the, my most rewarding favorite project um and i've done complex projects right even in the current state at the city of newark you know i, I launched a hundred million dollar fund with you know at the time i'll just give you the public information with a substantial raise already um usually that takes one to two years we were able to accomplish that in six months myself and the co-ceo the ceo of invest newark um i'm working on a expanding the train station with a pedestrian bridge. That's a hundred million dollar project, structuring that from beginning to end. But uh, Hope Village um, is like the most um, rewarding project. And I will say that we, for various reasons, really Hope Village is a result of five years of work for me. Um, when I got into uh, Goldman Sachs and when I transitioned specifically from Anheuser Bush to go to law school, it was all about going into impact investing and really creating financial structures that made it feasible for corporations to appropriate their general revenue um, and to invest in communities, specifically communities of color, and still attain a positive return on that, right? So I'm just trying to make it more convenient and um, flexible to leverage tax policy to do more work in urban and rural communities. Because specifically before that, that was not the case. We see a lot more of that specifically now as a result of you know the civil rights um, unrest that has happened this summer. Um, so it's really five years worth of work about me wanting to craft social impact bonds and what type of bonds. So basically social impact bonds are pay for success loans. And we know that corporations, it's really about the data. We're gonna put 
corporations, we are going to put our money behind something that's going to give us something back. And the feel good is not just enough, right? Because that's philanthropy. We want to do more than philanthropy. So a pay for success loan or a social impact bond is about, I'm going to invest in something of a public policy, you know, nature, social nature, but I need to be able to measure the output. And homelessness is, you know, unfortunately something that's always going to arise. We just want to mitigate it as much as we can. And um, I, when I was part of a private equity group, we launched a social impact bond in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts dealing with homelessness. And coming from Newark, I knew it could be done here, but I needed to find a fixture that was really reducing homelessness, not just servicing homelessness. So when Sakina Hoyt, who's the executive, she's the homelessness czar in the city of Newark, and I'm sorry, this is a long question, but I think a long answer to the context is important because it's really about strategically thinking about what the value chain is, who the people are, and pulling them in, right? And it's not just really just about a great idea because lots of people have great ideas. Ultimately, we want to execute, and we execute by getting the right resources and the right people in the same room. So Hina Hoyt was an executive doing homelessness reduction already. Um, she was invited to join the city. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, she, was jo she joined the city in a different, she was doing workforce development, but I knew that her background was homelessness. Um, so I said, okay, I think this is my moment to do some work. So I engaged with her, was talking with her. She seemed still, even though she was doing workforce development, you know, your passion is your passion ultimately. And um, COVID-19 hit and there was, everyone was pipping. You know, we just had to align and do great work. Um, as a result, we can definitely see, and I live in downtown area in the downtown of Newark and you can visibly see the number of homeless people like increasing, increasing. And she called me in November and she said basically, you know, because of COVID-19 restrictions, the temperature is about to go down, but the way we handle cold blue cannot traditionally happen in this circumstance. Like we have to social distance, therefore there's a number of reduced beds. I don't know what to do. And because I was the fiscal responsible person or I was responsible for the fiscal, our fiscal operation during COVID-19 and all the federal dollars, I was familiar with like the regs and how tight they were. And in my mind, I was saying like, you know, these regs are so tight, I can't be as innovative as I want to. And because I kept studying that when she met her problem and my problem married. And I said, oh, I can flip CARES Act dollars in a 90 day period, because if it's longer than 90 days then I'm violating the law, you have a cold blue issue. Cold blue um, from a regulatory standpoint is 90 days. If I marry those two together, I'll be able to use these dollars for what you have, right? I've been studying containers for about six years. I've been trying to do containers with private land owners here in the city of Newark, things of that sort. So I said, oh, let's try to do containers. And just the, the it is married perfectly. Bloomberg Associates was already part of our ecosystem. They're working throughout the country. They were actually doing a project in California that was similar. And um, I said, listen, we have like 90 days to get this done. And this was above and beyond the work that we, we were doing. So myself, Sakina, two other departments got together. We were working night and day. I remember being on the call nine or 10 o'clock. This may be too much information, but Sakina had just had a baby. She's breastfeeding. It's just like, we are like in it, doing it. And um, I just brought the economic development and the operational arm to it. I'm not an expert in homelessness. I don't know how to provide, you know, uh, you, know, um, you know, substance abuse or things of that sort, but we got two leaders together and we made it work. And it was the, it's been the most rewarding project of my career, entire career, um, despite billions of dollars of experience, because it was true essence, grit and grace. And it was really true collaboration and teamwork and trust. Um, and I, it really showcased my ability to get things done, not just within the city, but within the state. Um, able to, my brand is one of trust. When people, when I'm at the table, people know that I'm not bringing them something that's like outrageous. I'm not trying to, you know, um, take money or steal money from them. I'm not trying to take advantage from them. So when I come into a conversation, it's serious. So the fact that, you know, people were willing to, you know, have a conversation with me to leverage building codes, to do the unthinkable, because this will be the third project like this in the world. Um, the first one was in California, the second one was in the UK, and then, you know, now this one. And um, so it was something that was unheard of, never done before. And I, you know, when we go back to the adjectives, I guess, that describe, that I used to describe myself, courageous, innovative, um, authentic, that is a representation of that. So, but it was definitely a team moment um, and really, really about the essence of trust and me recognizing that 
There was another senior executive here that was as passionate about it, as I about their subject matter as I was about mine, and that partnering with her was going to get this done. Great. Thank, thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Emily, for that question. We have another question from Brian. Hello, Mateus. Hi, thank Brian. you. Uh, Natasha, first, I want to congratulate you on all your accomplishments, and from what I can tell, it's probably just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you've already mentioned how you transitioned from the um, private sector to the public sector. Yes. But what differences have you seen between working in the private versus public? Um, what have you learned from it? And also, what advice would you give to someone that might be thinking of going one way or the other in their um, life choices? Oh, there's so many things to think about, right? So I had the privilege of being able to transition from private to public because I created basically a reserve for myself. Um, you know, we just don't play public servants enough. We, and we, we, we never can. The demand will always um, outweigh the supply. The supply of talent, the supply of resources is always going to be the case. As a result, therefore, we need more mechanisms like, you know, the White House Fellows at the federal level, and I would say after this experience, a more formal program for corporate entities, no matter what their age are, um, to deal with the local sector. I think there should be more private sector people within the local sector, but that ha it has to have um, guardrails. Like, you know, I came in and I was able to do the things that I can because I came in as an executive. And I often told people, I was like, I'm just an executive working within a government, government enterprise. And my intention was always to go back to the private sector because my career aspirations are about leading a corporation, being on boards. Um, so one, having a focus and understanding what the goal is, is important. Two, having the ability and flexibility is important as well. I told the mayor, I said, if you would have spoken to me a year later, I would have had to decline because I'm in my family planning stages. You know, it just wouldn't have worked. And then also I was at the sweet spot in my financial career or my career in the finance industry was that I could make the pivot and not be so it wouldn't be so devastating coming back. If I was a little bit more senior, I wouldn't have been able to to necessarily come come back to the you know the finance realm. If I'd have been too much too junior, I wouldn't have been able to come back either because then I would have been labeled a government employee. Um, so I think one, the positioning is important, why you're going, and then specifically when you're there, what are you supposed to be doing, right? Um, so the great thing about public sector is that there's so many things to be done. And what I realized at Goldman Sachs is that corporations really push policy, right? There's a, we're dancing, you know, the public sector and the corporation center are in an intimate dance with one another. And the vibrancy of a city or a locality um, is just, should be just as important to the corporation as the mission statement of the, the own, of a, the, the corporation itself. Um, you can't be a successful corporation in a city that's not being successful as well, right? It doesn't work because you need to attract and retain talent. We know that attracting and retain talent um, to maximize that ability, you would love for that workforce to live, you know, close to where they work. And if that, you know, the environment for which they're working in is not conducive for them, then they may skip over your company entirely, right? And then we also know that as employees engage more into the community, then you develop more, even more talent, right? So I learned how to code because a corporation donated products to my a local corporation or a state corporation donated uh, products to my elementary school, right? We want that interaction. We want to create an ecosystem. We want to create a network. Um, so I think it's just to understand how policy making happens is important, and to really understand that um, you know most public servants they're in their positions for a long time. That doesn't necessarily mean 30 years in a position means you have 30 years worth of experience. You have 30 years of experience doing the same thing. And what the corporate sector brings in is that it creates innovation and ex expedition uh, expediency, and we can build off of each other. And um, I think uh, you know there's an opportunity to have more of that happening at multiple levels, um, entry level, mid level, and at the executive level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No worries, thank, thank you. Thanks, Brian, for that question. We do have a question coming in from the chat box from Megan Lee. Um, what do you do to reset and recharge when things get too difficult? So I think all of us have 
I asked ourselves that question and for the last 12 months have experienced what that answer could be and it could be multiple answers. Um, what I've known forever <laughs> in COVID-19 um, and our response to it um, showed me was that I had to create another outlet is that travel has always been my outlet. So I know that once a quarter for as many years as I can count, I need to be on someone's beach or in someone else's country or someone else's city exploring. And that relief gives me release gives me an opportunity to just reflect. Um, also, once a year, and it's all typically always the fourth quarter, I do a weekend away. It could be a staycation, and I, I, I literally like reflect on the year and recharge. COVID-19 showed me that, you know, I need to learn how to have like literally, I'm sorry, I'm using the word like a lot, um, daily resets, daily affirmations daily um, conversations with myself about you're doing, you know, reinforcement of you're doing a good job. It's OK. Um, the anxiety level definitely increased for me. You know, we lost a lot of loved ones. Um, I lost my brother, you know, this year and, um, you know, or last year. And it was just um, made me reflect on. I know specifically what I want to do in my career. And while I'm not necessarily following a blueprint, there is a path. There's, you know, books to read. There's things to aspire to. But we really don't really have conversations about the journey of joy at all, right? And what that really looks like. And if we had more conversations about that, how more effective and balanced people would be and less unhinged people would become, right? And um, as I grow older and, you know, probably for the last five years, I've been focused on what is the totality of Natasha's life? What is that going to be like? And, you know, I'm known for, you know, being a maverick in corporate and professional settings. Um, and maybe personally, because I've always been private, no one knows anything personally about me. But also, I don't really know what that person, personal person would be. Um, what I do know is that I love people and I love eating and I love traveling. And, um, I needed to dig a little deeper because all those things were taken away during COVID-19, right? Um, so uh, what, how I choose to reset and release is I'm reading a lot, ingesting a lot of information, and then reaching out to a lot of people to really ask them how are they doing to create more memorable conversations. My desire is to create more memories now, um, and we'll see how that you know rolls out. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thanks, Natasha, for that answer. We have one final question. We have time for one final question from Claire, and Claire can join us via video, I believe. Claire? Yes, hello. Um, first, I want to thank you again so much for sharing your experiences and your insights with all of us. Um, you've clearly done so much pioneering and groundbreaking work, truly. Um, my question is this, that in the corporate world, it can often feel like proposing something new or different to what has been done for years and years before is kind of like swimming upstream. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to those employees and the people in advocating and giving momentum to their ideas, even when those are challenging the norm? Well, I think one, we need to pay homage to what already exists because it did add benefit and value at the time and maybe continue to do so. As we gather more information and we become more insightful about things, we have different experiences, things become more refined. And that is just the reality of process improvement. And that is a business paradigm. The goal is to continuously improve, um, to reduce costs, to be more expeditious, to advance um, at a, uh, you know, to, to be more innovative. So one, giving credence to what has already existed. Um, secondly, I think, you know, as far as swimming upstream and challenging and being an advocate is that trying to create an environment where that is not necessarily looked at as um, something that is surprising or abnormal to make it implicit in the work that we always do. So I personally, as I build teams, one, you're always going to know, like, if you're on a team with me and we're in a room, you're there for a reason and you can't just skate by. Like, you can't, everyone has to say something or add value to a conversation. And I, as a leader, also don't necessarily leave it up to you just to say something. I'm a teacher and a student at the same time. I'm trying to do work, but I'm also trying to, once again, cultivate the best talent, right? So I am observing, 
I am looking for feedback. I'm looking for interaction. When we're in meetings, I'm asking probing questions. Maybe I already had the answer to it, but I'm trying to see, are you critically thinking? Um, because, uh, and it's not that people aren't critically thinking, it's just that they may be thinking about the wrong thing at the wrong time, right? So I'm forcing and sculpting conversations and um, nuances in order to, for us to get to the next step. And as a leader in that environment, I hope that it would be appropriate and comfortable for you if you had ideas to bring them forward, right? But I think your real question is, if you don't have that type of leader, how do you do it? So I think that, you know, respect and reverence is, you know, that's always going, what do they say? Honey always gets you something, you know, better than uh, more bees, attracts more bees than vinegar. Um, and and I, I don't mean that to say like tone or, or things of that sort. What I'm just saying is that acknowledging, everybody wants acknowledgement for what they've done. And once you do that, it kind of dissipates any um, self-defense. And uh, once you do that, then you create and your propose your idea. And in that space, it may be received well or not, or even just overlooked. The third component, which is the most important component, is to then further support that with evidence. So if you really believe in something you talked about, then you know support that with hey, an article that I read or some other reinforcement that says, this is, you know, an idea that I think is applicable here, but there's also evidence that this is uh, demonstrative and value added in other instances. And then I think another trick is that getting a peer group together that also you all are the, the squad, the tag team, right? And you're sitting on a team and just, you know, sometimes we have to do these deliberate actions. They're always verbally supporting what you're saying. So if Claire has an idea, it's a difficult team. Most times the, the team doesn't accept new ideas, but Emily and Claire are on the same team. And every time Claire says something, Emily's like, yeah, I agree with that. You know, I thought about that too. The amplification method is very, very powerful, right? Because it's a behavioral component that makes someone say that once you repeat things two or three times, you tend to believe it. So we have to we have to use all of these skills in order to advance our causes. And the more that we use them, the muscles become more reflective and uh, reflexive. And therefore, it doesn't seem uncomfortable for you to advocate for yourself in the way that you need to do in order to get your work done. Great. Thank you, Claire. Appreciate that question. Natasha, sadly, we're coming up on our hour, and I know we could probably be here for another hour talking about so many topics that we couldn't really, we couldn't cover it all today. But I think Claire put it aptly, uh, you are a pioneer, and the work is really groundbreaking for your contributions to the city of Newark and, you know, so many more contributions to come. I want to thank you for your vulnerability today and your honesty. Really refreshing to see that courageous leadership to be able to share both personal and professional um, your goals and and um, lessons learned. So any final thoughts before we we turn it over? Um, one, once again, I just want to say thank you all for allowing me to be here. I don't think I've had ever the opportunity to meet with a millennial resource group within a company. So one, the fact that it exists um, is important. And then secondly, the fact that I was invited, you know, I, once again, I'm, I'm humble to you know be a part of here. Um, the what I guess words that I would like to leave or last impressions is that um, young people, millennials and Gen Y in any generation um, have done you know significant pioneering work. And specifically, I do not want the work that has happened last summer to go unappreciated, um, right? So the work that people did on the front lines doing the civil unrest and the outcry of you know police injustice, resonated across the world and corporations one would think there would be no connection but i think a lot of conversations and corporations are happening specifically doing that work when um michael brown was killed in st louis i was at goldman sachs and i basically grew up professionally in st louis and no one was having a conversation there you know there were so many people of color suffering in silence um and then to unfortunately have you know the same things happen, but to look at the glass half full or some semblance of it if you can, and to see that you know there are more conversations about how are you feeling, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And really about, you know, even though a police officer isn't trying or an adverse police officer isn't doing something negative to me personally, that trauma really resonates in all types of workplaces and all types of scenarios, right? And to really have that conversation to say, and how does this translate into the work that we do 
um, and how you show yourself and bring your whole self to work is important. And while this conversation wasn't necessarily around that, and this kind of, you know, this is the millennial group and not necessarily the black resource group or things of that sort, it's important to know that we can't let, let life moments um, go by outside of the corporation walls and feel as though it's going to just be business as usual. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you so much for all of the all of the lessons and, and uh, gems you shared with us today. Uh, and hopefully we can keep the conversation going. And for those of you who watched for the last hour, I hope you um, lots take lots of takeaways, I'm sure. But um, we should all ask ourselves how, from what I learned, what do I need to do differently? What do I how do I need to show up differently? given some of the conversations uh, we participated in today. So I hope that there are some food for thought as we um, as we end today's show program and, and keep the conversations going. I did want to bring up Megan, Megan Cox, to talk about Level Up. Thank you, Matthias. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Megan. Um, I'm part of the leadership for Level Up. Um, I really want to thank everyone who joined us today, um, as well as a special thanks to Natasha and um, everyone who put this wonderful event together. Um, if you're not familiar with Level Up, we are one of the business impact groups here at Panasonic. Um, we serve as an internal professional development network, and we hope to help bridge the gap between generations here at Panasonic while helping the next, next generation of Panasonic leaders recognize and grow their potential. So if you're interested in joining Level Up, all are welcome to join, even if you're not a millennial, we call that the millennial minded. Um, just send an email to levelup at us.panasonic.com. I'll get you added to our Teams group, um, and then you can be a part of the conversation and be the first to hear of um, hopefully a lot of future events. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to Alex. Thank you, everyone. Natasha, I am a fan, and I cannot wait to cheer you on when you become CEO of that company. <laughs> um, really excited to have you. Uh, Mateus, Megan, thank you so much for partnering with our office. To all of those of you that have been watching, we want to hear from you. Um, this is a, a, an important series. We want to continue on to continue having these great conversations with leaders across the country. So please reach out to us. We look forward to bringing you more dynamic sessions on our Leadership in uh, Diversity series. Uh, I wanna especially thank a lot of our behind the scenes colleagues that make this happen. Jack McGinnis, Jerry Rizzle, Kevin Leonard, Liz Almeida, our employee council and our executive council. Thank you all so much for the support. We hope you have a great Friday and a wonderful weekend. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Panasonic.